when you're asked about the concept of self in terms of transaction and analysis, how would you describe it? How does that come through in transaction analysis? Could Anyone? you change your ego state? Ego state is one of, definitely one of the ways. You, if you were asked you know, to describe the concept of self in terms of transactional analysis, you say, yes, well, it's the fluid movement of ego states throughout any given day, through parents, adults, child, okay? So the self is made up of stage, states from which the ego operates. Let's not get bogged down into technical language. Really what it's saying inside of us is that we've got, um, we've got these ego states that we operate from and that may constitute self in transactional analysis terms. Does that make sense? Okay. What I want to drum in tonight is, um, I'm going to move on in a second. In fact, let's move on to the next slide, the self-concept. Okay. Right. The aim of tonight is to understand the role self-concept plays in the counselling relationship. This is really important. The objectives Describe the meaning of self-concept. Okay. How did Freud... What was one of the ways that Freud described the self-concept? In terms of... Okay, we've just mentioned parent, adult, child. Ego, it. Ego, it, and superego. So that could constitute the <coughs> self. Okay. What these are are models of how the, op the psyche may operate. The psyche is intangible, we can't see it, it's invisible. So what we have to do is um, construct models so that we can get an understanding of how people think. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent yeah. stuff. Great, so we're going to describe the meaning of the self-concept. We're going to identify the importance of gaining understanding of your own self-concept. That is going to evolve throughout the rest of the course. It's not going to be done in half an hour with a pen and paper. Okay? Recognise the importance of the self-concept in the client's journey. Okay. So there we go. Right. Just before we go any further, here's another one to think about. Carl Jung, who was basically an eminent psychoanalyst, a psychoanalyst, and he stemmed, if you remember, um, he was like a son, if you like, to Freud, to Sigmund Freud. Okay? And they went their own separate ways eventually. But Carl Jung was an eminent psychoanalyst in his own right, very, very well known. Um, and he said this, Enlightenment consists not merely of seeing luminous shapes and visions, but in making the darkness visible. The latter procedure is more difficult and therefore unpopular. How many people here have been to spiritual type things, meditation type things, and said, oh, I can see this luminous object, I can see this, I'm getting this colour, I'm getting that colour. How many people in here have done that type of thing? Yeah. yeah? So quite a few of us. I love that type of thing. I, I did further down my path. And then I sort of, I love the feeling, I think, of the groups I was in, and then I started thinking, that's all well and good, but what exactly is it telling me? And I think Carl Jung had seen this. People sit round and they do these things and meditate, saying, I'm getting this light and getting this, but what does it really mean? And it's very easy to do that and sit round in groups and saying, I'm getting this colour, or, you know, I'm getting this, this shape, and whatever. It's very easy, but it's much more difficult to delve into your own unconscious mind. Okay. And by definition, you're going to need help to do that because it is unconscious, it's unknown to you. And that's what he's saying. For me, enlightenment is precisely that. The way I describe enlightenment, and there's numerous ways of defining it, and none of them are right and none of them are wrong. It's quite a subjective thing, I believe. And the way I describe enlightenment personally is to bring stuff, to, to bring material out of the darkness of the unconscious into the light of consciousness, hence enlightenment. You know, we're enlightened when we know something and we don't know what's unconscious. Okay. Really allow this to sink in. 
the unconscious mind and what's unconscious is going to become really important for you as counsellors because the question why is not really a question a counsellor should ask too much because most clients don't know why why are you like this why they don't know why don't they know why it's unconscious okay which brings us on to this the Jahari window has anybody heard of the Jahari window okay I'm going to show you a very short video on this and then we'll elaborate on it we don't need to go but you can see that there's four sectors here and you might say this is the psyche of a person as well it was it was brought together by somebody called Joe and Harry and that's why it's called the Joe Hardy window incidentally <laughs> Um, I forget the second names now. We will watch this short video. But you can see on here that we've got, first of all, the arena, the conscious arena. It's known to all, okay? So the arena is stuff that you know about me and then I know about myself, okay? Nothing in. Part of the counselling really is to expand that, okay? We expand that by doing stuff. Right, also, I am. Um, there's stuff that's known to others. So let's see somebody has got some trait that's really annoying, but they don't see it themselves. And one person tells them, and they ignore it, they think that's his opinion. Then somebody else tells him, and he thinks, well, maybe I need to look at it, I don't know. And then several people tell him, that's really annoying you doing this. Anybody who wants to self-develop would at that point start saying, hang on a minute. There's a lot of people telling me that I'm annoying because of this trait. I need to look at it. So that would be a blind spot to the person themselves. Okay? So that's something others can see in you, but you can't see yourself. Does that make sense? Okay? Here, the unknown, nobody knows. That's the unconscious. So nobody knows that. Okay? And this, known only to myself. Now that can cause problems as well. I used to have a very critical superego that really wanted to batter me. And I, it would say, oh, you've done this when you were younger, you're weird. You know, and, you think, and it'd probably be something quite insignificant. And eventually, you know, whatever. But it would build up in my mind and build up in my mind. I wouldn't tell anybody about it because I thought, if they find out this about me, whatever it might be, and it would probably be something very stupid, then they'll think I'm weird. And that's when you keep things to yourself, secrets if you like, that can get out of hand and they can drive you to destruction as well. So we can see here in these four segments, there's a lot of work to be done. Again, that's just a model to understand what the psyche of a person may be because it's intangible. Okay? These are all models that at some point will become useful to you. Okay? So you might say within a person's psyche, there's a part that there's a part of the mind that they know about and everybody else knows about that to share with people okay there's a blind spot where other people will be able to see traits and things about them that they can't see themselves and therefore help them okay there's a part that's unknown to all but don't forget what is unconscious is not dead and buried it's buried alive it impacts our life okay it might be out of consciousness, but um, unconscious material can severely hinder our life at times as well. Um, you know, people who have really bad mood swings and take off for no reason at all and they say, I'm really sorry about that, don't know what come over me then. That, that is an example of unconscious material impacting on a person's life and driving them into unpredictable behaviour and they don't know what the driving force is because it's unconscious. Our job is to probe and to find out what exactly it is, <coughs> okay? And going back to transactional analysis, what other part of transactional analysis might reveal things that are driving people I am, to unpredictable behavior? Life script, yeah, okay. Script messages, script attributions, okay. Derogatory ones, maybe, but that is the the history of a person. 
and we can go and investigate, and that's what we do as counsellors. We investigate people's psyches, if you like, people's history. Okay? Okay, so just before we watch that short video, we were talking about these four segments, another model of the mind. And I'm not going to reiterate because I think we've pretty much exhausted that. So let's move on. Now, this is the thing that we really need to come to terms with um, uh, as counsellors. The, the concept of self. How is the self comprised? Think about, at the moment, um, about everything is fluid. Nothing about you is static. Is your body static? Why isn't it static? It changes all the time. Yeah? Yeah? Um, it's radioisotope studies tell us that we have got millions and millions and millions of atoms in our bodies right now that have travelled through every other species in the world within the last few months. Okay? Right now through our breathing, we're breathing in parts of each other and taking on each other. I'm taking on your atoms, you're taking on my atoms. Radio isotope studies will tell us that you've got a million atoms in your body now that once belonged to Jesus, Saddam Hussein, and you mention it in your body. We're forever, if you like, we're recycling our atoms with each other. So although our body appears to be something that's stable and belongs to us, if we go down to a subatomic level, on an atomic level, we'll find, no, it's not. It's forever changing our body. Okay, so we, we're getting the idea of even our body is fluid. Okay, what we're interested in, obviously, as counsellors, is not the part of the self we call me. That's physical. Really. That can add to psychological pain, um, but we're dealing with the part of the mind uh, sorry, we're dealing with the mind, with the psyche. And here, what we're saying is, so who are you? I know we've asked this question before, but it's so important. Um, I, I do want to cover it again. So here, yeah, often when somebody says, who are you? I say, I'm Paul Anderson, you know, I, am, I teach psychology. I, am, I work with computers, I'm a computer programmer. I am, I'm a writer. I am an uncle. I am, I... I believe in this, I believe in that. So what I'm doing here, first, often when we say, who are you? We describe self, first of all, by a label, which is a name, okay? That heads it. And then we often describe ourselves in terms of maybe gender, age, vocation or employment, faith base, family positions or roles that we play. And here is what's really important to us. Beliefs, ideas, notions and attributes. Okay. This can be really fluid. Okay. The thing is there, obviously we can't really change our age, but most of them other things we can change. So if that's me, and most of them things changed, do I still exist? Why is that? But what's changing? The self. So what about the self is changing? That sort of that sort of getting in on it, yeah. So what you're saying that uh, we're not looking um, for an external check. Um, what what we were saying before when we looked at the video, I'll come to in a second. It, and pick that point up, Christy, okay. Um, well, here, the things that are probably changing, we can change gender nowadays, we can change our name, we can change our vocation, okay? So all of these things really tell us that what we refer to as the self is not a static entity. It's fluid, it can change. It's like a computer program. We can rewrite it and it'll do something else. And we can rewrite our psyche. We can reprogram our psyche and we can become different people. Okay? Primarily, I would say that when we're working with clients, we're probably going to be working around beliefs, 
in particular beliefs. And I reiterate that a lot of people think, because I believe in this, it is a truth. That's what they were talking about in the video. Okay, and it's not a truth. It's one of many truths. It's not wrong. But the thing is, with a belief, it's just an idea that you hold to be true. And most of our belief system is imprinted on us in infancy, in childhood. Okay. And that's great when the beliefs that have been imprinted on us, during, especially in our early days, work for us. Because if a belief is just an idea that we hold to be true, okay, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, because it's just an idea, what's stopping you changing it? Nothing. <laughs> exactly. Probably your conditioning. Okay. It's easy to say you can do that. And it's easy for me to stand here after doing psychology for many years and doing a lot of self-development and say, you can change it. And that sounds very easy to do. But when we've had things like major belief systems imprinted upon us and they're etched into our unconscious mind, we just accept that to be us. Okay? But it's not. And what they want to get in mind, you know, is it, is this really you? And the answer is, yes, if we take a snapshot of all these things at any one given moment in time, we could say, that is your current self. Okay? But it's fluid. And I think in a healthy human being, the self should always be evolving. Okay? You see it, you see people who stagnate and then they start to suffer with different things. It may be anxiety, depression, um, then things can creep in. Not just stagnate, if they're affected by different things in life. Um, all of these syndromes and symptoms can start to develop. So in a healthy human being, we're normally open to change. Okay. One thing we've got to remember as counsellors, which we'll come to, is that our belief system and our biases and our propensities can um, cause us not to gain rapport or be open to what a client's telling us. And what we're trying to draw in here, if the self is flexible, if the self is fluid, then I may totally disagree with the beliefs of my clients because we've had different upbringings and whatever, but that doesn't make them wrong and it doesn't make me right. Keep an open mind. That's where this is all going tonight. Okay. Try and jump out of your own programming and understand it from the client's point of view. And that is called in counselling a very important concept. Yeah. Do you think you just said it, Angie? Empathy. Empathy, yeah. Empathy to understand, to understand um, the world from another person's point of view. So, we were saying here before, you just said when we were looking, the early self-concept as it developed, okay, it's tangible concepts. I like this, I like that, I can ride my bike, okay. And they're the early days. I don't want to go too much into that. Um, and then it starts to develop. And I think as we get a little bit older, still in childhood probably, I am, you know, these things become happy. I am creative, I'm outgoing. Achievement, isn't it? You know, they run to the parents, look what I've done, I've got a gold star. That becomes, that all starts to feed the self at a very young age. The achievement, the gold star, you know, the feeling good, the self where it develops, or it could be, they get the fee, they get the gold star in school, they go home and the parents <coughs> more or less dismiss it. What's that gonna do? It's gonna kill the self-esteem of that child, probably. And these are all things that in transactional analysis terms we might look at in the life script, in the history, in the way they've devised, the template they've devised to get the needs met as children. But they've never evolved that when they've come into adulthood. So there's still, it might be that, you know, one child every time he never got his needs met or she never got his needs met would stamp the feet and do cartwheels on the floor and scream the house down. And the parents, that was the only time the parents come running in. In adulthood, they're still doing that and screaming the house down and all that and you can't form relationships. The link there, can you see what we're doing? And we'll do more of that when we come to psychodynamics. 
Okay. These are just another things that we start to we start to get cause, don't we? We get into our teen years and whatever, and you get an affinity, you know, maybe I'm a conservative, I'm a punk, I'm a goth, as they said there, um, and so on. So we start to get and these can all help to shape the concept of self. Does that make sense? Good. Just really for the time being, when we're looking at the concept of self, I think we beliefs is when we want to start, I think beliefs is looking, you know, what beliefs does a person hold? That's a good place to start. I love this, Charlie Chaplin saying, I am what I am, an individual, unique and different, with a lineal history and an ancestral promptings and urgings, a history of dreams, desires, and of special experiences, of all of which I am the sum the total. The sum total. Okay? And I think that's great. Basically, we are the sum total of all our experiences, are we? But, think, when we talk before about the locus of evaluation, when we're young, we take in an awful lot of evaluation of others, and we own it. You're stupid. Um, respect your elders. Uh, money doesn't grow on trees. And we're taking all of this in. I think, for me, as counsellors, what we need to do is strengthen people so that their core self, or let's say their ego, um, starts to grow stronger and the external evaluation is not as important and they start to repel the things that are not working, the imprinted beliefs, they start to repel them, let go of them, strengthen their own internal or core self, okay, and then what you have is an internal locus of evaluation. Most of my, I take notice of what people say to me today because I need to at times. I need to have, I've got blind spots as shown in the Jahari window. And sometimes I get on people's nerves, something they tell me enough times. I believe them, I think I better do something. I'm normally quick on the uptake today. I am, but I need that at times. But also I need to, I don't need to take, I, am, I don't need to take derogatory comments or, of, of people who would try to inflate their own sense of self by putting me down for no reason at all. And there's lots of people out there like that. So therefore I need to strengthen my internal um, lo locus of evaluation. You know, I know today when I'm doing good in life. I don't need people to tell me. I don't need people to say, oh, you must be really proud of your drinking and this, that, which I go in life. I don't, I don't really like that today. And I, I could have said that, and it would have been untrue going back, because I was probably proud. Today, I don't want to know about the past. I, I have one day, and I want to, I want to live each day till the fall, and I don't care what happened in the past, really. That's my own philosophy. So my, my own core self is strengthening, I feel, day by day. Can I ask a yeah? question? Go on, Sue. What does locus Mean. It's just like focus in a, like in a sense. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just it's a strange it's word. It means like location, doesn't it? Yes, that, that would probably be the that's locus. That's where it of, comes from, I think it's Latin. Right. Isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Focus. Right. Okay. It, it's, it, it's, it's like a cross or a hybrid, really, of focus and location. Right. So it's something that we're looking at. So if we, if we turn it to location, as Angie said, Okay, so the location of evaluation is coming externally. Yeah. And then, as counsellors, our job really is to bring the location of evaluation to within the person, to strengthen their own core self. Does that make sense? It's what I thought it meant. But yeah. I to make sure it's one of them words, to be yeah. quite honest with you, that I've never looked up the meaning because I, I sort of, I know what it means. But I've never been asked to define it funny enough, so that, that's a... Thank you, Sue. <laughs> and thank you, Angie. <laughs> okay, so this is important as well, was it? Anne, what was her name? Anne, something about that. You said this, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. What does that mean? It's a strange thing to say. Perception, isn't it? Perception, exactly. And are all our perceptions different in here? Yes. 
And why would all our perceptions of certain things be different in any given event or circumstance? Because we all experienced it differently. And where are we looking? We're looking through the lens of what? Of our own condition. We're looking through the lens of our own condition. We're looking through the lens of our own history. And that is biasing the way we see things. I love what Deepak Chopra says here. We add ourselves to what we perceive. I think that's a great saying. Okay, so we're all, you know, something might happen in here now. We, we all might perceive it differently. Some might laugh, some might cry, some might get angry, some might be nonchalant and couldn't care less. Um, you know, but this is because really our history, our life script is like a lens that colours the world in its own unique way to any given individual. Is that okay? Like that same Paul, isn't it? Yeah. No self, no problem. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. <coughs> right. So we see we see the world as uh, sorry, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. And that goes for counsellors as well. <coughs> We're not immune to that, okay? So the concept of self for counsellors, okay, our sense of self develops through experience and interactions with others. I don't think we need to elaborate too much on that now, do you? I think we've emphasised that child, childhood experiences imprint on us really very powerfully. And they, um, they program us to be the way we are. Okay. And it's funny because at some point or other, we're normally, remember in hypnotherapy, we're associated to our history most of the time, or we're associated into our thoughts. But through different techniques such as meditation, we can dissociate ourselves from our thoughts. Mindfulness is one of the ways of doing it. And we can take a look at the psychological self inside of us. We can monitor our thoughts, we can watch them. We can dissociate from them. And that's a fantastic practice that I love to do. You know, to have a look at my own thoughts. It's to sit quietly. And it's just mindfulness. Let my thoughts come through my mind and be non-judgmental. They're not good, they're not bad. They're just thoughts. Okay. Right, yeah. And I think it was Carl Jung that said, we have 60,000 thoughts every day. Right, and this shows the inflex inflexibility now and again. And most of that 60,000 are the ones we had yesterday. Okay? And there's other sayings, isn't it? Who was it who said, um, we, come, we, we come into this world, I am, um, we come into this world, or what was the saying? I am unique, basically. And we go out of it, a copy. Most people come in this world unique, and you go out a copy because a lot of people just follow the flock and I don't know about you I don't want to do that with the rest of my life I really don't honestly I'm not trying to be big or you know I just don't want to do that anymore I, I don't know for that years ago so so our sense of self develops through experience and interactions with others we're going to go on to psychodynamics after I um, probably start from next week and um, we're going to go into that that'll We'll still be concentrating on childhood stuff at that point. Okay, so the, the, the concept of self, the organised set of characteristics that we identify as being unique to us. Okay. Most of them, things we won't know about. But if we want to enlighten ourselves, if we want to bring them things from the unconscious mind into the conscious mind, then we have to do work. And that's what Carl Jung was saying. That work is unpopular. Because it's easy to close your eyes and say, I'm seeing shapes and colours. Doesn't really lead to a lot of things. So, there is no truth on the perception. That is really important to us as counsellors. Because if you're sitting there and you're very static, if you like, and you've got very strong opinions, and people are talking about their opinions and whatever, you're going to get blocked. You're going to have no flexibility whatsoever. So remember that something that you hold as a truth is not universally true and equally what other people hold as the truth is valid so we have to validate people's truths even if we don't agree with them at times okay. 
We're not there to advise people and get them to see our way of thinking. We're there to encourage them to evolve in their own right, to evolve their own beliefs, the beliefs that work for them. Okay, distortion. Okay, any introjected values or conditions of worth that might, may lie unseen within us will distort how we view the world. Okay? Does everybody know what a condition of worth is in here? We haven't covered it really. We've covered it briefly, but we haven't. We'll cover that more in a person centered type stuff, cognitive behavioral stuff. Conditions of worth. Anybody not know what we mean by that? And please do put your hand up if you, if you don't know. It's like the good girl thing, is that I'm a good girl okay. because I, I've done the dishes, I've done right. my homework, the things that make Say you do your good. homework and you're little and you do the dishes and your mum says to you, you know, you're really so good and you get a lot of attention, okay? You, that might become a condition of worth. Only if I tend to other people, well, I, you know, will, will I be worthy, okay? So you may become a doormat when you get older. You know, people walk all over, you do this, do that, you're doing it and you're running around. Because you've got this belief imprinted in you. They call them core beliefs elsewhere. You know, you've got the core belief that I must tend to other people to make me worthy. And that's come from a life script which gives a condition of worth. I am, that says, it, that's come from a situation where maybe you've run around after people. And they have... They have reinforced it with their language. What a good girl you are doing the dishes. You know, what a good girl you are cleaning up. And then when the 50, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, can you clean this up? Can you do that? Can you? And they're like a hand rag. They're like a doormat. That's just one quick example we could look at. So the conditions of worth is that we feel worthy only when we fill certain conditions. We'll look at that a bit deeper in a minute. As reflective practitioners, we need to be aware that our own truths may well be flawed. And that's true, isn't it? Okay. We need to be flexible and open to changing our self-concept when new information comes into awareness. Okay. Freud also said that the human being is primarily a defensive organism, if you like. And we do. We tend to defend our beliefs to the hilt. Even if we've got an inkling we're wrong, pride gets in the way, and we'll defend them. As counsellors, we need something beginning with an H. I am. Um, uh, we, we need to gain this particular attribute, and to look at ourselves. What would that might be? Are we beginning with H? Exactly, humility. That's one big thing we need to do. Have humility. Become humble and say, yes, I was wrong. And believe me, I had some eye-openers when I'd done my counselling training years ago. I am, And I cringed. And I looked at myself and I cringed again. And then I thought, that has to change. Okay? And transaction analysis was brilliant for me in that. Because... I found when I started to grow myself, I become the, very much the nurturing parent. And I wanted people around me to be the child because I felt like I was needed and I was helping and it was bolstering my own self-worth. But sometimes it was at the expense of keeping people in the child role. That was one of the things I cringed at myself and thought, I've got to change that. I didn't know it was something I didn't have that education at the time. We've all got it now, and you know, there's different things. Be prepared to look at yourself and say, Yeah, actually, that's not working, it's not right. It, in fact, it wasn't even my belief, it's something that's been it thrust upon me when I was younger, and it doesn't work anymore. And change it. Being aware of seeing the world, not as it is, but as we are as individuals allows us to be more open to opinions and truths that challenge our own. Okay? I've been in counting training rooms training people and I've heard people say, I don't like to be challenged. And that worries me. Okay? 
I've never known anyone who said them words to finish counselling training and incidentally. There's only been a few, but I've never known any of them to finish counselling training. Because if you're not prepared to be challenged, then you've got no humility and you're not open to other people's beliefs and truths. Does that link back to the I'm okay, you're not okay kind of thing? Yes, probably. We could do it in terms of life positions. Yeah. So that would be, um, if we look at um, where we're not flexible and where we're not listening to other people, is that what you're saying? Yeah. That would be, I'm okay, but you're not okay yeah. type of thing. Yes, that's, that's valid. So if you don't want the challenge, it's like, it's like Yes, because the, uh, the sort of, I'm okay, but you're, uh, you're not okay, it's is an arrogant position. Kind of yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a position of arrogance, quite frankly. And it will still, there'll be reasons why people are like that. And this is what we must understand. Just because the symptom is arrogance, separate the symptom from that person as a whole and don't see the whole person as arrogance. Because you'll probably find over there there's a frightened child somewhere. Okay? And that's where I tend to aim with people like that. Okay? Great stuff. Being aware of the verse for that. We're able to value a client and their truths or beliefs with unconditional positive regard. Okay, that was a Carl Rogers thing, person-centered. Okay, person-centered counsel to um, to value value your clients with unconditional positive regard. In truth, can we have unconditional positive regard for anybody, everybody? I don't think I could. No, I think I'd be telling lies if I said I've got unconditional positive regard for everybody. But in a counselling environment, um, I do to tend to have unconditional positive regard. Well, can't um, we change? You're saying no, now you can't. But can't you change? Well, I just don't. I, I just. Can't I, you I change just, me? Yeah, I don't want to change. I don't particularly want to have unconditional positive regard for everybody I meet out there because they haven't earned that. Yeah, so you're saying you need to have it for the counselling yes. position, but you don't need to have it in the real world. Yes, that's, what, that, that's, that's just me and often that's subjective. I am, I'm not going to have unconditional positive regard for everybody out there if I don't think they deserve respect. Mm. But then I'm not working with them people. Mm. But as soon as I go into a counselling room, then I'm able to do that. Okay. And don't worry if you're affected by what people say. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, as human beings, you will be affected by certain things they say. But try not to allow it to affect the counselling relationship. We'll be doing lots more of that anyway. Let's stick with this for now. So bear in mind that your history and the lens, the lens you're looking through, your perception, can be distorted at times. And be aware of, uh, be ready to become aware of that and change it if you need to. Can I just ask, you know, if you're working with clients, yeah. you can just say, you know, they've got a, a distorted belief, so they've got low self esteem and they yeah. think that they're you know, not good enough for anything, they don't deserve a partner because. That you know, they're not good enough. Yes. How can you value that if you're trying to help them see past that, or do you just value it like for the now? I, I wouldn't value it at all. You mean, uh, where's the value coming from? Sorry. Because. You've got to value their truths. Haven't you? Okay, right. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I think it's confusing using the word truth. That was something that was used on that video. I'd sooner use beliefs. Right, and when what you're talking about there is really is cognitive behavioural therapy, okay? And when we look at cognitive behavioural therapy, we look at distorted thought patterns. You don't value, you don't have to value them. Okay. It's valuing the person in general. Oh, just the general yeah, person, yeah. Okay. Um, you don't have to value distorted beliefs. Uh, we, we definitely don't want to do that. But what we need to do is identify distorted beliefs, okay? Say somebody has had it imprinted on them as a child, I must be good to everybody. I must like everybody. Okay? And the, again, people are putting them down. 
but they would they still I am um, they don't relent they still and again they become like doormats they become like handbags they get used and whatever we can say that in liking people is quite com it's contextual really you know you, you don't have to like everybody but some people have had that drummed into them. I see lots of them into them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's normally people with very low self worth and they feel that they must really um, appease everybody. Okay, and that would be, we look at the cognitive distortions, the call when we took on to cognitive behavioural therapy. Thought, what's the thought? I don't want to go into all of that now, Christy, yeah. but you when don't we. have to value them. No, 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 no. You know, it, it's it's difficult. I mean, you may get people who have abused other people, and you may say to yourself, "Well, how am I supposed to have unconditional positive regard for that person?" And if everybody was honest in the room, they may say, "No, I haven't got unconditional positive regard." We've got to be very honest. Yeah. The thing is, is that in the case of abuse, for instance, it might be that the abuse has been something that has happened, they're acting out what happened to them as a child. So when we explore that person's history, that abuse has been an integral part of their early life. So although they're told it's wrong, and they know it's wrong at a cognitive level, at an emotional level, because it's been an integral part of their life from very early on, they think it's normal and it's difficult to change. So what we need to do sometimes to get that rapport, to get that understanding and to start to get that po unconditional positive regard is listen to a person and don't judge. I think that, you know, somebody comes in and sits down and tells you something, we tend to be very judgmental. People are defensive and you say, are you judgmental? Oh no, I'm not judgmental. I'm judgmental. I don't know anybody who's not judgmental. But in the counselling room, I try to put all of that stuff to one side and listen to the full story, listen to the underlying issues and then to put a picture together. Concepts of self for the client, okay. So let's have a look at this, this is quite wordy but we'll read them in this one. A client may hold ideas, opinions, truths and beliefs that are causing them pain. This is what we were saying before. We don't want to honour that. We don't want to value it because we'll be reinforcing it. Okay. Example: A client values themselves as a high achiever who has found themselves in a situation where they feel they cannot currently cope. See this with a lot of students. You know, real high achieving students, and uh, their family are forever stroking their ego, if you like, saying, "You're fantastic at that. Look at the grades you've got." And they feel that their self-worth is dependent on them achieving, okay? And then something happens in their life and they can't cope. They can't achieve, they can't get the grades they once used to do. And all of a sudden, depression might kick in. You know, the very thing that got my needs met, I'm no longer capable of. So you've got what's called an incongruence there. So it's gone. When this client checks this self-concept, they find a belief that says they are always able to achieve and when this is compared with the reality of not being able to cope, it creates a mismatch or an incongruence. Okay. And the client feels psychological distress, which can come out in many different forms. One of the main ones in that one is probably depression. Okay. It's likely these damaging beliefs will be invisible to the client and out of their awareness. Remember Jihari window? Now it, it should start to make some sense to you now. The Jihari window, this will be in the unconscious sector, not known probably to anybody. Okay, <clears throat> I think sometimes when we look at the Jihari window, um, when we're working with clients, um, okay, so they have these damaging belief systems, but they don't know they have them. We might be seeing it through symptoms, depression, anxiety, whatever it might be, phobias. So really what we're trying to do here is make what's not known to anyone, perhaps 
we want to uh, get it known to us. So where are we looking at there? So known to others. So it could be that from a damaging belief that's not known to anyone, we start to question things, we start to analyse stuff, and all of a sudden something might come up. And the cause or the catalyst might start to become known to us, but still not known to the person themselves. It might be that through our talking, the person themselves will pick up and make connections. Okay? So if something starts to make sense to you and you start to intuit something and make connections between the past and the present, you might want to start to say, I'm seeing this in your life, you know. You're not able to form relationships in adults or that you're having real difficulties. And when you were younger, I, um, you know, it, it, you, you were given messages and you were told not to trust other people, whatever. And it, it seems like that may have become a core belief of yours. I am, and that is preventing you because of mistrust and whatever. This is just a scenario I'm making up as we go along. I am, that, you, you know, it's being prohibitive in you trying to make relationships with other people. How does that feel to you? Not I'm right, I've got it. You know, um, that is one of many scenarios that one. How does that feel to you? And quite often when I do this with people, they, they say, I never thought about that, but that. And you see a little light bulb go on. If that light bulb doesn't go on, if you don't see it, and it, it, it's pretty plain to see, you're probably not on the right track, try something else. So you can see where this starts to fit in as well. So it's likely that these damaging beliefs will be invisible to the client and out of awareness. So entwined into their self-concept, don't forget, it's like a matrix, the self-concept, that is knitted together from when we're very, very young. So the chances are they won't know it. That's why we use our counselling skills, probe and, and that type of thing through open-ended questions to try and get at what lays beyond the threshold of consciousness. Okay. Someone's trying to their self-concept that if they were to be challenged, the client is likely to defend them. And they do become defensive. So they defend beliefs that erode them really sometimes. We're going to do more of that as we go on. So faulty beliefs start as what, um, as what are called introjected values. Okay? Again, when we're young and our conscious mind or the critical factor hasn't developed enough to repel things we don't agree with, we don't really have an opinion. Therefore, we have a tendency to interject or internalize the values of other people and own them ourselves. But as we get older and we have more life experiences, they don't make any sense to us anymore but we still act on them because they're so ingrained. And they become static at that point. There's no fluidity. So we need to get things moving in a person's psyche. And psychodynamic, that's what it really means. Psyche of the mind, dynamic, movement. Movement of the mind. When the mind's moving, we've got a lot more chance of, um, of helping a client than when they've got static and rigid beliefs that are not working for them. Okay? Which are the values of, so introjective values, which are the values of others that are adopted by a person when they were a child, may be part of the life screen. In the above example, the client may have excelled at school and the teachers may have told her she was a very high achiever. Then parents re reinforced this praise. She is taking the opinions of others and using them to value herself. Okay. This is called operating from an external locus of evaluation. The result is the belief I am a high achiever and this is valuable. Okay. Let me give you an example of that. I've seen somebody going back many years ago um, who 
was training to be a doctor. I think it was a doctor. Okay, and they were very bright. Okay, and doctors, as far as I know, they have to do two degrees, the equivalent of two degrees, one in medicine and one in surgery. I know that was the case. And it's about seven years, so they have to be pretty bright. Okay, they were doing that, and the condition of worth was, I am worthy when I'm achieving. This person was a brilliant musician and wanted nothing other than to be a musician. Because he played the piano and several other instruments as well. So when she's young, it was imprinted on her to achieve. It was reinforced by language from parents and as teachers. Those around her were saying how good she was at getting these results and whatever. But her own core self wasn't strong enough to repel these. So she took them on board and part of her life script was or conditions of worth where I must achieve. And I, I think her mum and dad were actually doctors as well. So I must keep it in the family. I must follow family heritage. So she was being shoehorned, if you like, into, into a career she didn't really want to go into. And as a focus changed from an external locus of evaluation to internal, to listen to her core self, what did she really want? She wanted to be a musician. And that was, she come with depression because she was pursuing something in life with everything she had, with all of it there, and doing well at it to a certain point. But then there was a conflict of interest. This is not really what I want to do. It doesn't flunk my boat. It doesn't give me a sense of purpose. I want to play music. And she did go on to do that eventually. So they're the type of things that we can look for. Okay? This is just the diagram of ideas. We don't need to look into that. Oh, you know the yeah. beliefs that are like unconscious or invisible. Yeah. Are they difficult to elicit from someone in therapy then? Or it, the, the belief systems? Mm. No, because there's different ways we can get at beliefs, and most of it is through probing, through exploring. Okay, so you, you will break through. If they're very defensive, it may take longer, but you start getting the poor, so you pace a person, you talk to them, you take an interest in what they're telling you, then you start to go back, you start to explore the history. And with all the knowledge you'll have by the time you finish next year, you'll start making connections like private investigators. The past. I can see this has happened, I can see this has happened, I can see this happen. And then what you'll do, you'll put it to your clients. You'll say, I'm seeing this pattern, what do you think of this? So that they can elaborate. And that tends to start bringing stuff up from the unconscious. And once the ball starts rolling, normally it gets larger and larger and it elaborates. And a lot of things, again, a lot of things come from the darkness of the unconscious into the light of the conscious mind where we can actually deal with them, process them. Okay, so just before we had our break, we were talking about this scenario with the girl who's told by her teachers and by her parents how good she is at at education, how good she is um, at school, let's say. Um, and her parents are telling her how good she is. It's being reinforced by a teacher. So internally, she is developing this belief that I am worthy. Okay, that's a condition of worth. So here we've got the teachers and parents have created conditions of worth, meaning the child feels a sense of worth if certain conditions are met. This one being high achiever. There's loads of different conditions of worth. Okay. So for example, I am worthy of praise and love when I achieve. That would be I am that that would be sort of an example of of the words used internally to herself. Um, that would be the foundation of her belief. So when the client is not able to cope, she feels a mismatch or incongruence of what she knows of a truth. I don't like the word truth there, so I put belief in brackets. Okay, so what she knows of her belief and that which she experiences in the here and now. So her belief is that she's a high achiever and she is very capable because the external um, locus of evaluation 
has told her that and she's taking that on board it's being imprinted from outside on air but now internally she feels she can't live up to that so you've got a mismatch of what she's been told via from the external locus of evaluation into what's going on in the internal locus of evaluation the internal locus of evaluation is i can't do this anymore or i can't do this right now in my life and that leads to a symptom that's the cause that's the catalyst the symptom like we said before could be anxiety could be depression could be self-harm could be drug addiction okay drug addiction i've said many a time um, and alcoholism to me is a method of escape it's an escape mechanism okay so when people can't cope they drink alcohol i am um, compromises the blood brain barrier affects the frontal lobes of the brain that is where we uh, that houses our inhibitions um, and when alcohol hits the frontal lobes of our brain we become uninhibited we've got a problem going on like this okay we feel that we can't live up to the locus of evaluation to what we've been told to the ego strokes we've had as children you know that you're very good at this we can't live up to it at this present in our life so what better method than to pick up a drink we drink and when we say we become when we drink we become uninhibited that means we don't care just for a brief while can you see how the hoop goes in and that's this will give you an insight into drug addiction as well for me haven't been there and I haven't been virtually the lowest of the low I know that from personal experience and I don't see any difference to alcohol as just a liquid drug so bear in mind when you're dealing with people with drug addiction as well when the client is not able to cope she feels a mismatch or incompetent uh, we've done that we? so not coping equals I'm worthless that's what it boils down to self-esteem plummets and she's in trouble okay due to incongruence between the self-concept and the here and now the individual can feel tension confusion depression and develop maladjusted behaviors okay that could be all sorts of things i am you know rages that sort of thing okay is everybody getting what we're talking about here? Okay. So, in therapy, we help clients identify and break down conditions of worth that have been adopted as truths or beliefs. It's a truth to them, if you like. Like I say, truths are not universal. They're subjective most of the time. Okay, so we can help them change that. And we're going to be looking at loads of ways, particularly with cognitive behavioural therapy. So we might go in <coughs> with psychodynamics and explore a person's past. Okay? And when we've explored the person's past and we've come up with maladjusted core beliefs or cognitive, um, co cognitive distortions, we might start to we might initially work with psychodynamics or transactional analysis okay and then we might move into cognitive behavioral therapy and say we need to change this belief system let's see how we can do it and what better way of imprinting a new belief when a person you give them a form and you say okay the abc of cognitive behavioral therapy the activating event is something happens in the life and they have a belief associated with that okay so it could be a um, let's say i am um, activating events a man with a gruff or rough voice speaks to a person and the belief might be from this person this man's going to attack me this is ones i've seen and the consequences are they avoid making relationships with men particularly with rough voices that might be a typical one where somebody's been abused physically abused as a child okay right but that belief's not really it's not serving them anymore it did as a child because 
the significant other was abusing the person, let's say, so that belief stood true. But then it becomes what we call in cognitive behavioural therapy a cognitive distortion. And the cognitive distortion, normally in this case, will be generalisation. Whereas that belief held true for, let's say, the significant other who is abusing them, so they have to protect themselves. Okay? Now they've grown into adulthood, they're finding, let's say it's a girl and they can't, they're not forging relationships with males. Okay? And you've explored the past and you find this reason. And they've got this core belief that maybe all males should be mistrusted. Don't trust males. Okay? If you do the ABC, so the A is activating a event in cognitive behavioural therapy. So the activating event, they come into contact with a male for some reason. The belief sits here, males should not be trusted. The consequences, they don't try to communicate or whatever, and they move away from males. Therefore, the girl is never going to form a relationship, a meaningful relationship. So, I take this further. You've got A is activating events or antecedent, it's called. B is belief, the belief that is uh, connected with the activating event. The consequence of that, which in this case is not formal relationships, meaningful relationships with men. Okay, then what we need to do is dispute that belief. There's the D, A, B, C, D. Dispute that belief. What other belief could I put in its place? Well, actually, contextually, if you look at it rationally, back when I was a child, I was right to have that belief because I couldn't trust. But you might change that to belief to most men can be trusted. If you'd done your hypnotherapy and you started to get them to really dwell on that, then that belief is probably going to become uh, more embedded in their unconscious quicker than if you did it at a talking level counselling. So this is where you can then use your hypnotherapy as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's loads of going up here. So the process enables to move from an external to an internal locus of evaluation. That's when we take the power. When we've got an external locus of evaluation, everybody around us holds power over us. When we start to have an internal locus of evaluation, we take our power back. We start to expand ourselves. We're not swayed or biased by what other people are telling us. So we strengthen our core self. In transactional analysis team, what part of us would we be trying to strengthen there? The adults. In Freud structural theory, we'd be trying to strengthen the... We'd be trying to strengthen the... The ego. Yeah, ego strengthening. So ego strengthening is a big thing in counselling. Does that make sense?